All right, welcome to the panel on how teaching online helped me rethink my teaching face-to-face. Uh, -face. We are very excited to have four panelists with us today uh, from totally different departments and disciplines across UCSB. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves and tell you very briefly why they teach online, what they teach online, and how they decided to teach online. So uh, we have Iker here on the right. And if you will please start, and then we'll just go across the panel. So my name is uh, Iker Aranz. I'm coming from the Spanish and Portuguese department. And it's my fifth year here. And I'm teaching basically the BAS program courses, which include uh, culture and language as well. And this was a, bit, a little bit challenging to just start an online course in past language and uh, culture, but this also uh, was a good opportunity for us to spread uh, the offer we have because we're a very tiny program and the, the opportunity to have it online and combine both culture and language in one online course was at the same time challenging and a great opportunity to, to make it more visible. So, yeah. I'm Kara Mae Brown. I'm a lecturer in the writing program and in the writing and literature major in the College of Creative Studies. I teach a class online called Writing Web Content. Uh, so the short version of why I teach it online is I thought it was actually an important skill for students learning to write on the web to do it on the web. <laughs> um, and also selfishly, I started developing the course when I was pregnant, and so I was looking forward to ways that I could still teach, um, but also spend time at home with my daughter. Um, I'm Amy Jamison. I'm from the Exercise and Sports Studies Department, and the course I teach online is Nutrition for Health. Um, I think it was originally driven, well, two factors. Number one, uh, the great demand for the course. We have hundreds and hundreds of students a quarter that are on wait lists that um, desire to take the course. Um, and the second reason why I thought it was an important course to teach online is just the content itself and how it applies to practical approach to life. So skills um, relating to lifestyle and behavior modification that are really important for everybody. So I would like to spread the message as wide as possible and I think being able to teach it online um, offers more availability to students. They don't even have to be here on campus. So that's the kind of long-term goal. My name is Thomas Even, and uh, my affiliate department is Ecology, Evolution, and Marine Biology. Uh, I teach a fully online course. It's EMB 22. It's Concepts and Controversies in the Biological Sciences. And then I'm also currently uh, co-developing with Dr. Alice Nguyen a very large hybrid um, introductory biology laboratory as well. The reason that I actually started to think about presenting the face-to-face -face course, which was 22, as an online variant was I was really interested in bringing science to a broader audience, and it seemed a perfect venue for doing that. Um, we're constantly confronted with biologically based issues in our society, and I thought that this was a very, very good venue and format for delivering that, not only to our, our campus as a whole, but it's also UC-wide. So that's why I basically picked that for uh, 22. For EMB2LL, which is the introductory biology course, the, the needs were much more logistic in nature. So this is a massive course, services approximately 1,000 students per quarter. And we were just having problems delivering that course in enough times in an annual cycle to students to get, maintain our throughput. So this was a way to actually squeeze two laboratories together, uh, take content out of the laboratory that wasn't necessarily best delivered in a face-to-face -face format, presented in an online format instead without having to dump the content, and also to be able to provide students the opportunity to take the course multiple times in a year. Thank you very much, all four of you, for responding to that question. I'm going to follow up with another kind of general question for you, um, broad about the, the courses that you teach. And this time, if we can start with Tom and work back the other way. All right. So what is the biggest difference between teaching online and teaching face-to-face? You know, there's quite a few differences with online courses. Probably the biggest is right off the bat is the amount of time and effort that's front-loaded into the development of such a class. It's a pretty monumental undertaking. And so typically a face-to-face -face course organically evolves in its development. 
and you can have some fairly broad ideas about how you'd like to tackle it, the assessments that you'd like to include, topics that you'd like to generate. But for an online course, you must, it really is necessary to have a very cohesive uh, vision before you even begin to tackle it. And so it really makes you think about what are my goals, what are my learning objectives, what are the assessments, and how do I build a structure around that? So front-loading is definitely an issue. Um, another major difference is learning how to use the instructional tech is, can, can be quite daunting. And uh, what I've found is it's best to find people who do that <laughs> and, and not worry about it so much as a faculty member. So I think the best thing you can do when developing an online course is to sit back and really think about the vision. And that's where you spend the vast majority of your time. And then it's finding people who can implement that vision. Getting a good team around you is really important. The other major difference is learning how to stay engaged in it. Because once you've actually created the product, then you have a tendency to step away from it. And it can run, for a fully online course, it runs pretty autonomously. And so how to maintain your engagement in that class and your interest in it can be a little bit difficult. You know, you have a tendency to step back, it runs itself, and the better it runs, the, least, the, the less work you have to actually do to stay engaged in the product. So that's a big difference as well. And then just uh, learning how to translate what you do in a face-to-face -face class uh, into the online. For me, lecturing was really tricky because I use a very interactive lecturing style and that was really difficult to translate to film and there was a really steep learning curve there. So those were some of the differences that I've seen in terms of uh, a startup of an online versus a face-to-face -face class. Sometimes the, the goals and the objectives are quite similar but how you get there are quite different. I agree. Um, to kind of add on to that because I have similar um, experiences with those differences, I would say Getting the immediate feedback and interaction from students when you're face to face, you know, questions and comments and being able to engage with them immediately on the content, um, that's virtually impossible to do um, on a day to day basis or lecture to lecture basis on an online format. So, getting creative in ways that um, A, you can keep the students engaged during lectures and B, be able to um, get some feedback. Um, whether or not they're actually learning and, and understanding the content um, without a huge delay, right? So you can kind of capture and, and catch anything that might be lost in translation. So I would say that, on top of, of the things you pointed out, was something to really put some thought into um, along the way. I'll probably repeat at least some of what's already been said, um, but I'll try to say it in a new way. Uh, I think that for many of us, especially once you've been teaching a class for a while, and if you're a relatively talented teacher, you can kind of get by on winging it quite a bit. I hope this is a safe space to say that. <laughs> um, I know especially for me when I'm developing a syllabus, there's some time around like week eight where it just becomes like there be dragons, you know, and I'll figure it out when I get there. But with an online course, you really can't do that. You have to really have a solid plan for every day, every lesson, every, um, every assignment. One thing that uh, doesn't exactly answer the question, but I think is important to point out, um, I teach writing, which is inherently interactive. Um, so it's a really different experience. I don't get to step away from my online classes uh, because I'm constantly responding to my students' writing. Um, and that, I think, has actually reminded me kind of how hard it is. Um, because I think when you're interacting with students face to face on their writing, you develop a bit more of a relationship. And it can feel a lot of times online like y you feel more like an editor in a way that you're just getting these submissions coming in to respond to. Um, so sometimes it's, it's just been a reminder to me of, of how much work that is and how important that work is, because I think that sometimes the actual work of responding to writing gets lost um, in the face-to-face -face interactions. So yeah, I think I, I will agree with uh, most of uh, what my partners say here. Uh, but I would like to mark too, that, uh, what is the process before uh, designing the course, which is a little bit tricky too, just to, to make the proposal, to, and I still, administration is still a little bit picky with uh, the <laughs> online courses and for me my experience took four attempts to get the course approved and then start designing so the amount of work it's 
pretty big when it comes down to an online course uh, comparing to what it will be uh, the face-to-face -face. Uh, but at the same time I think uh, it offers the opportunity to interact with the students in a very different way and in my experience at least I, I left behind many less useful or more rhetoric stuff what I use in face-to-face -face. and you have to go straight to the point most of the mm -hmm. time in online courses and th your students don't have the time because that's one of the reasons probably they are taking the online course so you have to give them exactly what I need they need and they still leave them some some space to connect the dots so it's a very difficult balance uh, you have to which in face-to-face -face you we can manage in, in a different way great thank you um, I'd like to ask you each now to give an example of how teaching online helped you rethink your face-to-face -face courses. Uh, can I, Iker, can I start with you again? Sure. Uh, so probably I'll continue in the same, almost in the same direction uh, I was just saying now. Um, in my previous four years experience of face-to-face -face teaching, uh, you uh, you build up and you learn and uh, how to teach but you don't have uh, the same feedback from students in uh, uh, online courses the online courses give you the opportunity to interact uh, i think closer because you have to monitor you have to be almost in a gold mode all the time so everything works out and you you can uh, know them a little bit better as a student and how they think and what they like, what is working in their course, what is not working. And all that feedback that probably in the face-to-face -face is not, it's not happening until week nine, then when they just, we go with the envelopes and the evaluation forms and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the online course happens in daily basis. And that part helped me a lot in taking more time probably in my face-to-face -to -face classes to just know better what they want and how to give them. So I think teaching online has helped me think about what can be done outside of the classroom. Uh, so engaging with different digital tools, so being able to make video lectures or using um, online discussion boards, anything like that, sort of helped me to think about how I'm using my time in the classroom and think about ways that I can still use those tools in a face-to-face -face class, which frees up more time when we're actually all together to maybe do more important work or more work that's easier done in, in a group. So I've started adapting some of my um, online course materials to my face-to-face -face courses so that part of my students' preparation for class might be watching a video of me talking about something that would take up some of our class time. And we're able to do a lot more small group work or discussion or peer review in the classroom. And I think that's actually been really helpful to like, maximize the efficiency of my course. I have two specific examples. So the first one is the struggle I had in my face-to-face -face course or continue to have um, in the very large lecture halls. So something I, I really value in the classroom is having student collaboration, uh, small discussions, question and answer, um, so a lot of interactive components. And when you're in an Ivy Theater with 520 seats and you can't see the, you know, most of the rows, it, it becomes virtually impossible. So one of the elements I put into the online course were the threaded discussions, um, so topics of the week or of the, the day or whatever. Um, and I would group students together because I, I actually have 150 students in my online class, so I even made smaller groups within that um, and allowed those sort of discussions and then I was able also to communicate in the small groups or even one-on-one -on -one with students through those sort of discussions, um, not only in my online class but now in my face-to-face -face class, so kind of the same thing of being able to maximize class time or be able to do activities that I couldn't accomplish in a really large lecture hall. So I've been able to implement that and it's been really successful, I think. Um, the second thing that I learned and kind of adopted um, almost not by accident, but kind of by case scenario um, were those online lecture or teaching moments 
that I was able to implement in courses where we had unexpected situations. So for example, the natural disasters that occurred, um, some of my classes were canceled like everybody's, and so I was able to do quick online videos because I know how to and present that information to the, to the students. Um, we did that again this quarter when I had a faculty member go out on a medical emergency and we couldn't find subs quickly enough so I said ah I'll do an online lecture and get that information to students without canceling so that was kind of a, a positive that came out of it so I've been teaching professionally probably for about 30 years 15 as faculty member here and one of the things that I learned from online education that was really valuable was all the analytics that are available to you um, allowed me to really assess how students grab information, how they utilize it, the times they utilize it, and they also gave me insight into why they're doing it. And so one of the things that, that helped inform me about my face-to-face -face courses were that I used to build face-to-face -face courses where I would roll out products sequentially and I would open things up on a weekly basis. And I found that wasn't how students were actually accessing information. And so when I did that on my first one of an online course, it was actually quite a failure. It didn't work very well at all. And what I found was when I opened everything up all at once at the start and students could access anything at any time, that was very successful. So what I started to do in my face-to-face -face courses is do exactly the same thing. So instead of having a weekly rollout of lecture material or uh, any type of assignments, I just open everything up at once. And then I would close things on set times. So I almost do exactly the opposite. And that worked very effectively. And so uh, what I found was students appreciated that a lot more. And I've been teaching a long time, and you get set in your ways. And so it also gave me insight into the current generation of students and how they think and how they acquire information. And so one of the things that I changed also was my idea of how I laid out my assessments. I used to rely almost exclusively on high stake assessments. And I found that that was difficult because you'd go five weeks in and really have no idea how they were doing until you saw midterm scores. And so the online course showed me that if you had more small stake assessments that you could really monitor their progress and their understanding and they can make adjustments right on the fly in real time. So that was quite useful as well. Another thing that I found useful is I, I teach how to teach science to the graduate students in my department and I knew all the words <laughs> but in terms of really implementing what I was saying was different and so I always stress the idea of a backwards design concept when developing your courses and it wasn't until I did the face-to-face -face course that I realized, yeah, you really need to do it. And it really made me rethink how I was delivering a face-to-face -face course, how I developed a face-to-face -face course, and finally how I implemented a face-to-face -face course. It's been really useful in lots of aspects in terms of rethinking how uh, students acquire information. Another thing that has been very useful too is uh, I have operationalized grading. And so this is a really big advantage is reducing the grading burden in large classes. So there are many features that allow the grading to be done automatically. And there's lots of quizzes that you can utilize. There's different formats that you can bring in. And what has it allowed me to do is to spend less time grading, more time teaching. And also, um, another nice feature of it is it allowed me to increase enrollments. So you know, we're being so swamped, and especially in our department, in terms of the number of students. Like one out of every six students on campus is a biology student. And so our courses are just getting, you know, they're so heavily subscribed. But when in the old style, I couldn't take on enough students. But utilizing some of these skill sets that I've learned from online development, we've been able to expand our enrollments. And I don't see any decrease in the quality of the product that I'm delivering. So those are some advantages. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to open it up now to questions from people who are in the audience. So if you've got a question, just raise your hand and I will pass you the microphone. So who would like to go first? Some brave soul. Hi, I have a question about uh, writing assessments. Um, so perhaps Tom and uh, Kara May 
so you mentioned, uh, and I, uh, I think all instructors and the teaching assistants would be very grateful for reduction in time spent grading. Um, how do you do that if you're grading writing? It doesn't seem that that would be different <laughs> online versus in person, but perhaps you could both uh, comment on that. So l luckily, for the classes that I teach, you know, creative writing is not a necessity. <laughs> I'm looking for just pith. And so the way that we do it is we take a look at any type of an assignment, and the first thing we ask is, well, what's the best style of question to actually get at what we want? And so if there are ways to get at it via multiple choice or fill in the blank, something that can easily be graded automatically, we'll utilize it. If it requires higher cognitive thought processes and we actually need to get in there and subjectively look at it, what we'll do is we create boxes with word counts. And what it does is it really helps focus the students in terms of what they're writing down. And then we can get at the pith and the core with a minimum of intensity for grading effort from the TAs. And so what we'll have is what might have started out as a big series of short answer questions with essays embedded in it can now be reduced to a series of smaller, easily gradable questions with a series of maybe two or three really focused, intense, short answer questions that, that can be graded. And so we can spend a lot more of our time and effort and our intellectual capacity on those particular questions and actually give more valuable feedback. So that's how we break it up in the sciences, at least for this particular courses that I teach. So the bad news is teaching and learning writing is super hard. And doing it online does not make it any more efficient and it doesn't deliver it to any more students. Um, to me, that's not the goal of teaching writing online. So I'm afraid that it is just as hard. Um, so I, I can't automate my grading. I can't um, sidestep any of that. I can't enroll more students. Um, so you might, I, I'm just anticipating that you might be out there thinking, then why are you doing this? <laughs> And I kind of wanted to come back to my, my very first response um, and why I brought up my own personal circumstances with wanting to teach online. The main point to me is that teaching online is um, a critical piece of the puzzle of being inclusive. So just like faculty have reasons that they might need more flexibility in their teaching schedules, our students often need more flexibility. And I think that online teaching is a great way to reach students who might have disabilities, who might have illness, who might work or have family obligations that keep them from being on campus. So even though I actually think that teaching writing online is way harder, um, that's why I still do it and that's why I, I think it's still important. Um, there are a lot of people out there that will tell you that robots can grade writing. I feel like that's a whole other panel, but I'm here to tell you briefly that they cannot. <laughs> do any of the rest of you want to respond to that question at all? I mean, I could just say, again, I don't, I don't teach or I don't include too much creative writing, but when we do have um, free response type of assignments, I create really um, detailed rubrics, grade rubrics, so that the students know exactly what I'm looking for, um, and then myself, or if I have TAs that help grade, really can look for content, um, you know, specific words or, or information. So I would say maybe a, a grading rubric. Well, in my case, I, I teach language and culture, and, and one part goes for essays too, in the cultural part. And it's critical thinking, it's composition, it's all that. Uh, what helps for me is the since they don't have that much opportunity to interact face to face in the webinars or anything else, the the writing responses in forums and all that will help from the time they have to write the essay to the next essay to write something regularly, and that some somehow creates an habit too, and you can follow it. and uh, These are short responses too, and really focus and. I think for students it might, might be easier just to don't jump. Week four, I have an essay, uh, mm -hmm. four pages. Mm -hmm. and, and probably these, these discussions, these forums uh, helps in, in, in order to, to have a better composition sometimes. Great, thank you. Next question from the audience. Here we go. 
I guess my question could go to all the panelists, but um, is there a certain year that your students tend to be? Are they freshmen, sophomore? How, and, uh, how do you deal with motivation if they're younger students versus uh, the upper division? Well, the, the course that I teach that's fully online is a non-majors course. Uh, students run the gamut from freshmen to seniors. So sometimes it's the very first class they teach. I actually used to teach it to, as part of the Summer Start program, so it was incoming high school students. Um, sometimes it's the very last uh, course that a student may teach. The, the course is set up to allow those students to access it with ease. What I find is that it is a natural transition for these students because their cultural upbringing is different than mine. They've grown up with technology. It's seamless for them. I often think that the online course is probably an easier venue for them to actually experience than a face-to-face -face course, to tell you the truth. The difference between a high school face-to-face -face class and a face-to-face -face class at the university can be glaring in terms of the rigor, the independence that's given you, uh, the responsibilities that you have to have to keep on task. Online is a much more structured format. It's like, do this. This is when you do it. This needs to be completed by then. And the way they're accessing the information, seamless, part of their everyday life. And that type of structure, I find, is very common in their day-to-day -day lives. So I really see no problem at all. And like I said, in most cases, I think it's easy for them. The course that I teach is uh, part of the general education requirements. It fulfills the A2 requirement, and I get, and it's also, it had upper division only, but I get a ton of students who are taking it as, oh my gosh, I graduated, but I'm missing this requirement. Uh, so they have a lot of motivation going in. <laughs> um, but I think I rely on just the knowledge that I have about teaching writing anyway. So we know that um, students engage best in learning to write when they are writing about topics that are important to them. We know that they write best when they're doing some kind of authentic research. And so I try to use all of those best practices that I already know are motivating for students in the online space. My course is just a general ed, also um, open to non-majors, and so I get I get them all. Um, freshmen all the way up to seniors, the same kind of thing. It's the last class, I need a few more units. Um, but again, I feel like the format is kind of all-inclusive. So um, high school students are very tech savvy, um, better than me most of the time. So um, I feel like they can grasp it and, and handle it just as well as a, as a senior, absolutely. Yeah, my course too is uh, general education, but. Uh, because of the nature of the course, uh, I'm going to have people that are interested in Basque. <laughs> so that's already like an advantage. <laughs> they, gonna, they want to learn Basque and Basque culture. Uh, but it happened to me too that uh, people that had no experience in online courses they just jump into it and they enjoy it. And I think if I was, yeah, if I have to, to run a course, probably I won't go for an online course because my generation, we're just, a little bit uh, farther from technology, but but my students like they love it. It's just it's another opportunity to to interact with the gadgets and <laughs> phones and everything. And that part, I think they they love it, and it's it's kind of uh, easy to to get them into the course. I can't actually see if anybody's out there trying to stop me from speaking, so I'm going <laughs> to just go for it. Um, <laughs> I want to push back a little bit against this idea that students just kind of pick it up because that hasn't always been my experience. Uh -huh. I've had a lot of students who have really struggled with learning the technologies in a course, um, and that's actually something I've I've really learned from from doing this over time is that a lot of them do need instruction. So I rely on things like shared Google Docs, which to me is just a part of work life. Um, for some students, it's really new, and they don't understand that technology. I use Slack as my main communication tool in my online courses. A lot of students don't even know what it is, you know, need a lot of instruction and in, in getting up to speed on that. So 
I try not to take it for granted. I try to acknowledge that there are going to be students in my class who are, are going to be really fluent in technology and that there will, be, there will be ones who aren't. And so I try to make sure that the resources that they need are out there and accessible um, so that, because I know it can be really difficult for students who might feel less um, fluent, it can be hard for them to ask for help because they might feel like, left behind or oh this is supposed to be a part of my generation and so I think it, it you know making it accessible for everybody um, doesn't put them in a situation where they have to sort of out themselves in a way. To follow up on that um, what we do to ensure that students are all up to speed is that we have a series of very detailed tutorials so anything that requires tech of any nature in the course right right at the start in our introductory section on the website is a series of very detailed video or PDF tutorials that run through anything they would possibly need. How do you use Gaucho Space? How do you access lectures? How do you use Zoom? And uh, that seems to take care of about 90% of any issues. And then we offer you know, uh, uh, open access to either myself or the TAs to clarify any of the use of the tech. And it seems to work pretty well. Great, thank you. Next question. When going back to your face-to-face -face classes, is there anything that you miss from your online course development that you wish that you had uh, the availability to, or vice versa? I can speak to that. <laughs> uh, so I am a dual appointee, so I work in two different colleges. I'm an administrator of a small program. I'm an advisor to students, and so when I go back to my face-to-face -face classes, there's always a bit of me that's like, yeah, but before I could do this, you know, in those times in between, you know, it just, it, the flexibility really means a lot to me. It really helps me um, in other areas of my, my work. So I think when I come back in the fall with the face-to-face the -face classes, it's always like, oh, I have to here <laughs> and like relatively put together. <laughs> I would say that I've found it fairly easy to implement online um, tools and, and resources into my face-to-face. -face. So anything, I'd say it's the other way around. Anything that I felt was super valuable in the online, I do use in my face-to-face. -face. So it's not that I miss it, it's that I'm, I'm utilizing um, those tools. I would agree with that 100%. So anytime I find something successful that works online, I think, well, how can I incorporate this in the face-to-face? -face? Is it applicable? And so I find them to be quite synergistic. Anything that's working in the face-to-face, -face, I think, well, can I operationalize this technologically? And then anything that's working in the, in the online component, it's like, okay, well, this has a technological base, but is there a way that I can incorporate it face-to-face -face for better effect? So I actually think teaching both is really valuable because you're constantly learning and incorporating from both venues and one thing I noticed especially with the online that I quite like is we deal with so many students on an annual basis and there's a necessity to teach courses multiple times in a year and if I do that face to face I get quite bored so it's like it's just not intellectually stimulating to teach the same course three times in a year I teach it once and I'm very excited to teach it but the second time it starts to become pretty repetitive so what I find with the online courses is I can, I can teach that thing two or three times a year, and it's always fresh, because I was fresh when I did those videos. <laughs> um, I've actually taught the face-to-face -face and the online course at exactly the same time. And I found that that was in an interesting transition, but I actually stopped teaching the face-to-face -face variant because I found the online becoming more popular <laughs> and the face-to-face -face actually fading in enrollment. So it was an interesting transition. Hmm. Yeah, I have mixed feelings too. Uh, yeah, the online course incorporates a number of resources that are very useful for face-to-face -face and, and really can improve the face-to-face -face classes. If anything, I will miss the pace of the face-to-face -face because it's a very different pace you have teaching. And the face-to-face, -face, you can manage the timing, and if one day it's not that good, you can catch up next day. And But uh, there are no second chances in online courses, <laughs> <laughs> and you better do it right. And probably that, that will be the only thing, yeah.
I was curious how you adapt to your students' experience, level of experience and interests in both online and face-to-face -face courses, if at all. I think for my course, for my, well, now for both courses, because I've implemented the discussion forums and the face-to-face, -face, um, I always do an introductory discussion, kind of like an introduce yourself to the class. Um, tell us something about yourself or why you're taking this class. I throw in a question like that to kind of prompt them to give us a little bit of information. And so I have implemented that into the face-to-face. -face. That was one component, actually. It's a good example of something that I really liked online, I brought to face-to-face. -face. Um, and that way, it just gives me a little insight into where they are with the information, that their knowledge base, as well as their interest level. Um, and I, I can tailor some of the lectures toward maybe more common themes that I find in that intro discussion. <laughs> I'm trying to think about how best to answer this. I'm really passionate about writing. And I've found that in face-to-face -face or online, if I just jump in just assuming that they're going to be as passionate about me, which I know is me lying to myself, uh, they pick up on that. You know, if I just treat them like writers and I treat them like people with something to say, at a certain point, um, it seems to trick them into thinking it's true also. Um, so uh, yeah, early in the online class, I try to make sure that, um, that we're having full group discussions. My online class is very small, it's only 25 students. Um, I try to make sure that they're um, bringing in their own interests so they write about things that they get to choose, the topics. Um, and I just sort of jump into it, just sort of treating them as though they're there to, to write. And it seems to work, <laughs> or I'm deluding myself. <laughs> right ahead. Um, so for me, yeah, um, I have very small classes too online uh, because, yeah, with a small program too. Uh, I always try to make them feel as a group Something happens in face to face too. They just have uh, forty individuals, and I always try to okay. You're a group in week mm -hmm. ten, yeah, and, and you can interact. And uh, in online course is different. The dynamics are a little bit different, and the time you have access to students probably is smaller. But uh, yeah, I, I try to not only me but uh, them knowing each other too a little bit and having uh, conversation activities or having uh, little excuses to just know each other a little bit, yeah. The nature of the online course that I teach is such that students become engaged quite quickly just because of the, the topics that are covered. So the course is called Concepts and Controversy in Biological Science. So we talk about things like right to life issues, biotechnology, axial biology. Uh, there are things that hit students in the, at the home. And so right off the bat, they're pretty engaged. We don't really have a problem in drawing students in. For me, the problem is, and we have things like chat rooms that allow them to communicate with each other. Uh, for me, the problem is the disengagement between myself and the students. That's really the hardest part about online for me, how to maintain that. And what I often find is that the better the course runs, the less amount of contact I have with students, and they actually the one point of contact that I have that's a synchronous uh, contact point is the office hours. But what I find is the better the course is running, I don't talk to anybody office hours. I'm sitting there looking at the screen, <laughs> hello, <laughs> anybody please call me. So it's a little bit tricky. Um, I've thought about ways to engage, but what I have found is, and this has been a, a difficult thing for me, is to realize that what I deem as very important, which is synchronous, communication and education is not important to them. And often what they view it as is a burden. And so it's the freedom of access to information at any time that is convenient for them. That is really the driving force. And that's been a hard thing for me to accept because it's like, I am here, let's <laughs> talk. And they're like, no, we don't need to talk to you. Everything's running fine. If something's wrong, I'll contact you. And that's been a little bit difficult to grasp. But student engagement and interaction and interest has never really been a problem for this particular course. Tom, can I follow up on that one? Sure. Because uh, the other course that you are building right now with Alice is a 1,000-person 
you know, freshman, maybe sophomore course um, that they have to take. Mm -hmm. And so how are you and Alice dealing with these same kinds of questions for that course as you're developing it? We have the, this is a big course, and, and so the logistics of this course are what we spend a lot of time thinking about, is how do we administer a hybrid course to a thousand students per quarter? Luckily, we do have a face-to-face -face component, so there really isn't the same problem of the disengagement from student and instructor, because every week they have a TA who's dedicated to them. And all it allows us to do is to actually spend really beneficial and critical time on task and improve it. So the, in this case, the online portion of the course is very synergistic. It just allows us to actually increase our amount of contact time in a valuable way that matters and take more content-oriented things that really aren't the best delivered in a laboratory setting and put it into a format which is better suited for them to access information at the time that they see fit. Another major benefit of it is, too, is one of the biggest problems with introductory labs in general, the students come into the lab and they're completely unprepared. And so that requires a lot of time for the TA to basically do remediation, to bring everybody up to speed and waste a lot of that valuable face-to-face -face contact time doing that. So an online hybrid allows students to actually, in a way, we can manipulate and force them to be prepared before they come to class. They have to read the material. They have to access that material. They have to answer questions on that material before they are granted access to the face-to-face -face components of the laboratory. And therefore, they're much better prepared when they come to class. So we don't have that problem of disengagement in that particular class. It's just how do we roll something out of this size to so many students and do it effectively? That's really the trick here. Great, thanks. Amy, do you want to talk about that at all either? Because you're taking your online course and turning <coughs> it into hybrid as well. Right, so the, the course, the Nutrition for Health course, um, I've been teaching it face-to-face -face for decades, and um, I did the first summer, last summer, fully online. <coughs> um, and then I most recently received the grant to, to um, create the hybrid version of the course. So. You know, you'd think it would be so easy to do in terms of, oh, you have the face-to-face, -face, you have the online, just kind of mesh them together, but it's actually a completely new and different um, format altogether. So I do like the ability to, like you said, save some of the stuff that maybe doesn't need to be face-to-face -to, -face to online and then also have that accessibility to the students and students' accessibility <coughs> to the instructor and the TAs once a week, same, same format. Um, so it's a work in progress. It's not completed yet. Um, we'll probably launch it sometime next academic year. But the, the rationale behind that is similar. We want to be able to offer it more times per year to more students with less impact on classroom space. Um, so, yeah, it's, I, I'm still working on that. Um, I find it really interesting, and I think it's going to be fantastic when it's done, <laughs> but it's definitely a work in progress. Great, thank you. Um, I have one final question for you. We're just about out of time. And that question, I'll give you a second to think about it after I, am, after I ask it. Uh, all of you are speaking very knowledgeably from a couple years of teaching online now. Uh, and if you were to go back to before you started developing the course and what you thought you were getting into and uh, could give yourself one piece of advice back then, what would it have been? Ask for more money to do it. <laughs> 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 I, need to, I mean, I'm, I'm joking, but I'm not. Yeah. I mean, the amount of effort required to actually develop an online course is more than you will realize. And so the grant will never cover it, and you will work for free. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be prepared for that when you tackle a project like this. Uh, if I could go back, I'd tell myself, rely on your team, back off the project, don't be a control freak. Be flexible. Let people do what they do best and give them the freedom to do so, and you will get a better product. Retain the vision 
and let other people implement it for you. Don't worry. Don't get too caught up in the weeds of it. And so that's what I would tell myself is back off, be flexible, and realize you're going to not get the money <laughs> that you, you really need to roll the thing out, both in terms of the capital funding for the stuff you need to actually build it and also your own time and effort. I agree. I would say time, allowing sufficient amount of time to think it through, to build it piece by piece, to make mistakes and go back and fix them, um, not to rush it or assume that, oh, I've taught it for so many years, it's a piece of cake, because it, it's just completely different in terms of the build and, and the front loading, I think we talked about that earlier, is so huge. Um, so, kind of the same, the just, same just thing. Just to follow up real quick too. First iterations will never be perfect. And if you expect them to be, you'll be solely disappointed. And so that first beta rollout is going to be full of bugs, guaranteed. But the second iteration is really far improved. And then if you get another crack at it, you really have a clean product. So have some pilot, <laughs> pilot time and, and, and good people that maybe know your content well enough to know, like, oh, that was not the best way to deliver that piece of information. I think I would have told myself to push for the class to be even smaller. Um, and I kind of want to use this answer to just highlight once again some of the differences because for me, I think I probably have more contact with my online students than my face-to-face -face ones because there are um, different boundaries. So I, when I set up the, the Slack environment for communication for my students, I actually purposefully turned on you know, my mobile notifications for that because I wanted to make sure that I was accessible to them. And so I, I did set the boundary of, you know, I was only gonna respond during work hours, um, but I do, I respond sort of as things come in. And what has actually been really cool about that is I feel like I actually end up having more of a mentoring relationship with my online students than I do with my face-to-face -face students. But again, that's a lot of work. So I think that the class could be even more successful and have an even higher impact on students if it was actually fewer students. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I would agree with everything we, uh, my partners have said. And yeah, probably I'll have say, say to myself, like, just be patient uh, because you, you're going to need that. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to be fixing and, and rely to, and it sounds silly, but rely on technology. <laughs> because sometimes you're just wondering, is this platform gonna do what it says it's gonna do? <laughs> and and it's kind of challenging for me. It was a lot of work just to okay take off, like let it happen. And it was a good lesson for me because uh, really, I teach a different way. I think face to face now. I just like more relaxed to uh, whilst when you are teaching face to face, you wanna be in control of everything, make sure everything's happening the way you want. And yeah, probably patience and, and being able to rely on, on everything, every resources we have, probably was the best advice for me. Thank you so much, all four of you, for being on this panel. We really appreciate all of your answers and your advice and your responses. And I'd just like to end by giving you guys a, a round of applause. <laughs>